Keto and crime, keto and crime. We uncover the crime on keto and crime. Keto and crime, keto and crime. Now is the time for keto and crime. Hey everyone, Tracy here from Keto and Crime. Thank you so much to every single one of my patrons and channel members. You make this possible. And uh, you're one of the reasons I do this. And I thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And if I haven't said it before, thank you. I'll sing it. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there with me and letting me geek out, not making fun of me like a lot of other people do because I like weird stuff about crime and dark history. Re, re. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Keto and Crime. Today, we continue our study of the Catholic Church with one of its most infamous families, the Borgias. Da-da-da. <laughs> There's a lot more to it than what you saw in the Showtime series, which was an excellent series, just like the Tudors was an excellent series, even though there's a whole lot more to Henry VIII and Bloody Mary Tudor, which we will get to, than was portrayed in that in that show. But basically, to break it down, House Borgia was a noble house originally from Spain. Uh, they may have potentially been... Jew of Jewish descent, but that the which is kind of ironic, but the you know jury's still out on that. They were associated with the kingdom of Aragon, which you I know you've heard that before. Uh, King Henry VIII's first wife was Catherine of Aragon. It is associated with the royal house of Spain. And eventually, they found themselves in Rome at the height of the Renaissance in the 15th century. And as a result, became very wealthy merchants, patron of the arts, politicians, and yes, popes. A papal dynasty of sorts. And so that's what we're going to study. They've become legendary for their supposed you know, crooked ways, cruelty, and their willingness to do anything to maintain power. But let's take a look at that in the most objective way that we can. So let's dive into it. First, a huge shout out. Patrons, channel members, subscribers, thank you so much. I hope you're enjoying this series as much as I am. I have a special treat coming for you on the 4th of July. It's a kind of a little bonus video I've been working on for the last week. It's been quite exhausting and you'll see why. But I hope to have that out for you on Monday, July 4th. And happy uh, Canada Day to all my Canadian subscribers. I have a Canadian client. I know that July 1st, Friday, today is actually Canada Day, Canadian Independence Day. And, of course, July 4th is Independence Day here in the United States. So very happy Independence Day to everyone, whatever holiday you're 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 celebrating. It appears that July was kind of a bad month for Great Britain at one point. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, let's dive into the Borgias. So this Spanish family from Aragon came over to Italy and established themselves as merchants and politicians in the newly classical uh, city of Rome. Now, remember, Rome had been through quite a bit of transformation. Uh, Vatican City was up and running. College of Cardinals up and running. So you had the Catholic Church very much in charge of Rome during this period. Uh, but you still had your basic politics. And this family was able to ingratiate themselves through their money and through just being cunning into the world of politics. It's just like, you know, businessmen today stepping into politics, which there have been many, or business women stepping into politics, there have been many. So they pretty much ingratiated themselves into Rome political structure. And as a result, what is one of the things that you can use to stay in power in 15th century Rome? The Catholic Church. And as a result, 
They became uh, ingratiated with the Catholic Church, many of them becoming cardinals, uh, Vatican guards, many and two popes from the House of Borgia. So let's talk about the first Borgia Pope, Alphonse de Borgia. was born in 1378 to Francina Lyaconal and Domingo de Borgia in La Torreta Canals of the Kingdom of Valencia. And what does that mean in English? That means he was born to the House of Borgia, already quite prominent in Spanish politics at this time, in the Kingdom of Valencia, which is part of that Aragon Kingdom, which you would find a lot of the kings of Spain associated with. And remember, Spain and Italy had this, you know, alliance during this time, you know, which, you know, allowed the Holy Roman Empire to become a thing. Uh, so that's where he was born. He was born into, uh, with a silver spoon in his mouth. He eventually became a professor of law at the University of Lida and then a diplomat for the King of Aragon. So Spanish crown or one of the Spanish crowns tapped him to be a diplomat, and as a result of being a diplomat, he was able to visit other kingdoms and talk to other monarchies, and especially go to Vatican City and talk to the Pope, members of the College of Cardinals, and eventually he willed and dealed his way into becoming a cardinal in the Catholic Church. Um, now, what was he for many, many years before he became a cardinal? He was a layperson. He was a professor of law. He was a politician, which meant he had, you know, liaisons with women. He had relationships. So he was not a celibate cardinal, as you will find is quite common with the Borgias. Uh, so he managed, though, to, like, will and deal his way up into the College of Cardinals and eventually was elected Pope by the College of Cardinals in 1455. He was a compromised candidate, again, because of his secular background. This is the Borgia that the Showtime series is based on and probably the most infamous. Rodrigo de Borgia was born in 1431 in near Valencia, again, part of Aragon in Spain. He was named after his paternal grandfather. His parents were Joffrey, Lionel Escrivia, and a and his Aragonese wife, who was a distant cousin of Isabel de Borgia. So again, born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Um, he took his mother's family name of Borgia in an effort to further his own career. Uh, so that he could eventually become a cardinal and later on a pope, and basically began his career at age 14. So unlike the former Alfonso, he did not have a secular career. He began his career in the church when he was basically made kind of a errand boy by his uncle, Alfonso, who would eventually become Pope Calixtus III, uh, to work in church affairs. 14, age 14. Think about that. Because of his uncle's influence, who is now a pretty highly placed cardinal, he was promoted to being a canon at two Spanish uh, cathedrals, but his uncle persuaded the Pope to allow him to perform the job in absentia. He was like one of the world's first remote workers. He was performing the job from Rome because his Pope, the, his cardinal uncle wanted him there at Vatican City in Rome to be able to move his way up. So he allowed him to actually live at, uh, in Rome, be at the Vatican, but yet perform his duties at these two uh, Vatican's in Spain. And somehow that was allowed. So he began that job in 1448. When his uncle, uh, Alfonso, was appointed Pope Calixtus III in 1455, he quickly started to rise through the ranks, uh, through the College of Cardinals, and uh, basically he started out as a deacon, then he became a cardinal deacon, and then he was pretty much a staple in the College of Cardinals. And he continued to do that even after his uncle, who was then Pope, 
died. At the time of his uncle's death, he was a vice chancellor of the College of Cardinals, a basically second in command to the Pope at, you know, no more than 20 years old. And even though he was too young to seek the, uh, the Popeship, the papacy himself, uh, when his uncle died, he decided to cast his vote for a cardinal he was very close to, a man by the name of Pico Lima, who would eventually become Pope Pius II because he knew Pius would keep him as vice chancellor and he would have the Pope's ear so that in truth, he would probably be in charge. Um, but, <laughs> oh, I'll... Rodrigo had a wild side. Uh, he kept a long-term girlfriend who we will talk about. He fathered many children and he lived with his family in Rome in plain daylight. He was also known to attend orgies, to attend wild parties, and Pope Pius chastised him for that. And in uh, 1460, he received an official reprimand from the Pope uh, for attending an orgy. He uh, had his first child in 1462, a son by the name of Pedro, who he, uh, with a unknown mistress, he had many, uh, that he immediately shipped off to Spain to be raised by the Borgia family there. Later that same year, Pope Pius was calling for a new a new crusade, because all that was still going on over in the Holy Land, and uh, Rodrigo became his chief, chief fundraiser for that. But unfortunately, the Pope would die later that same year before the crusade really got kicked off, and so Borgia turned his attention from fundraising for a yet another crusade to trying to politic among the other colonies. Uh, cardinals to get another Borgia-friendly pope elected because he was still too young at this point. So in 1464, his friend, fellow cardinal Petro Barbo, was selected as Pope Paul II. Uh, he kept Borgia on as vice chancellor, but reversed many of Pius's reforms, which diminished the power that that job entailed. So he kept him, but he reduced his power. Uh, it was during this uh, the reign of uh, Pope Paul II that Borgia would fall ill with the Black Death, with the plague, but he did recover. And it was also during Pope, Pius, uh, Pope Paul's reign that Borgia would have first of several daughters, uh, a girl named Isabella, born in 1467, and another girl born uh, in 1469 by the name of Girolamo, also with an unknown mistress. As I said, he had several before he met his Girl, long-term girlfriend. But he did openly acknowledge both them and Pedro to the public, even though he did send them to Spain to be raised by the Borgia family there. Pope Paul died in 1471, so we have another opening for a new pope. And as a result, he went right back into politicking mode, helping a future rival of his, uncle, a man by the name of Francisco della Rovere be uh, appointed Pope Sixtus the Fourth. Now, Borgia knew that he he himself could not remain a could not be a pope yet because there were only he was one of three non-Italian cardinals in the College of Cardinals. So he knew they were never going to put a Spaniard into that position, at least not yet. So he put his power behind. Someone, again, he thought he could control and still remain high, highly placed. Um, the new Pope Sixtus IV was popular because he wasn't a politician. He wasn't very well connected. He was just a priest that has rose through the ranks. Now, uh, and so Borgia thought he could control him. And so, for a long time, he did. He kept uh, him as vice chancellor. He promoted him, making him a cardinal bishop of Albano, which meant he had to be ordained as a priest. I guess you could be a cardinal without actually being a priest first back then. And he also was appointed as papal 
Liggett to Castile and Aragon because this was the, the, the point that Isabel and Ferdinand, you know, the Christopher Columbus king and queen, married and, and united the two royal houses that would become Spain together, Castile and Aragon. Aragon was one of them where most of the Borgias were from. And what, with the marriage of Isabel and Ferdinand, Spain became Spain as we know it. And he was appointed to be a kind of a delegate to the newly unified Spain for the Vatican. He used his power to help negotiate the unification. He sucked up to King Ferdinand and forwarded the interests of the Borgia family that was still in Aragon. Uh, eventually, he did return home to Rome, and this is when he began, and he narrowly, narrowly surviving uh, a storm that almost sunk the galley ship that he was on. That and to celebrate it, he began his long-term affair with Valniza di Contini, who would be the mother of four of his children. Caesar, born in 1475, who would be pivotal in church politics. Giovanni, in 1476. Lucrezia, in 1480. And G Joffrey, in 1482. Now, these were the four children represented in the TV series on Showtime. By the age of seven, Caesar would be appointed by the Pope to Vatican positions. Seven, under the influence of his father. And so he began his rise to being a part of the church hierarchy. Seven years old. In addition to getting Caesar legitimized by Pope Sixtus, he also got himself promoted to be dean of the College of Cardinals that year. So not only is he's now even higher than vice chancellor, he's head of the College of Cardinals. And it was just in time because Pope Sixtus died in 1484 and it's time to elect a new pope. This time, even though he was now one of the wealthiest cardinals in history, his bribery, his threatening all the things he used to do, including calling in favors from other Spanish cardinals, uh, French cardinals, whoever, didn't work. Eventually, a cardinal from the uh, an altar faction, Cardinal Cibo, became Pope Innocent VIII, but not before Borgia met with him and negotiated for his own interest and the interest of his children. Game of Thrones hadn't got anything on the Vatican, um, on Vatican City, I'm just telling you, at least not during this time period. Um, so he became Pope Innocent VIII, and even, eventually Borgia became the Archbishop of Seville, and kind of pissed off King Ferdinand II, who wanted uh, that for his own son. Uh, and Ferdinand turned on uh, his former friend, uh, Borgia, and seized Borgia estates in Aragon and imprisoned his eldest son, Pedro Luis. Uh, Borgia decided to turn down the appointment and make nice with King Ferdinand and basically kind of, you know, negotiated that away. However, when he turned it down, it kind of made Pope Innocent upset, and he decided to punish King Ferdinand and basically declared a Vatican war. Yes, they had an army. Uh, declare war against uh, Naples, which was kind of a little splinter off part of Italy. However, Florence, which was its own city-state, Milan was its own city-state, and Aragon in Spain decided to support Naples over the Pope. Uh, Borgia, again, used his power of persuasion, bribery, and basically uh, fostered the College of Cardinals to push back on Pope Pius this, negating the war. And as a result, King Ferdinand, 
awarded Borgia by making his son, who was just previously in prison, Pedro Luis, Duke of Gandia, and arranging a marriage between his cousin, Maria, and this new duke. So now, Borgia's son is now married to the niece of King Ferdinand. So now he's not only a cardinal with ties to the Pope, he's also ties to the actual royal house of United Spain and Naples, which also had ties to King Ferdinand. Hence his motivation for stopping that war. In 1488, his oldest son, Pedro Luis, the newly married Duke, died. And a man by the name of Juan Borgia, another Borgia, became the new Duke of, Duke of Gandia. Uh... Basically, uh, for political reasons, uh, Borgia kind of negotiated the marriage of the new duke, one, to, one Borgia, to a young girl and acquired his youngest mistress, a woman by the name of Julia Farnese, uh, who was 15 at the time, and yeah. And then in 1492, about the time that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, you had Pope Innocent dying, and now Borgia is 61 years old. Did Lynn a 15-year-old? And this was his last chance to become Pope, so he knew he had to will and deal, poison, whatever he had to do. And after doing all of that, poisoning, bribing, strong army, he was elected Pope Alexander VI. August 11th, 1492. He had a tur turbulent reign as Pope, uh, promoting his children to high station, using his daughter uh, to as bargaining chips, using his young mistresses as bargaining chips, and doing he negotiated treaties between Spain and France, helped you know unite Spain into again a more solidified country. Also, uh, wheeled and dealed for Catholic settlements in the New World under Spain and under France, and basically did everything he could to promote the House of Borgia. He was also a patron of the arts, giving million, what the equivalent of millions of dollars to artists. Uh, so he was actually because of his reforms with money to help the people. He did. He was a very popular pope with the people. And as, as a result, went down in history as a pretty well-loved pope, believe it or not. Caesar Borgia, his uh, second oldest son, the one that was put into church service at the age of seven, by the age of 15 and 17, he was already a bishop and an archbishop. He actually resigned his, his station to pursue a military career and became eventually commander of the Vatican Guard or the Vatican Army and was instrumental in that brief war between the Vatican against Naples. And as a result, he got kind of a on the bad side of King Ferdinand II. He was just as devious as his father. He didn't fare so well without Vatican intervention. So he wasn't as good as people like to lead him on. He liked to let it be known that he was. He he did have some military victories, but most of the time he was just as manipulative as his father in getting things done. In fact, the knights that were that killed him would, would not have killed him if, if he hadn't have let his head get so big. He was always known for having kind of the big head. And uh, while on a expedition in uh, Viana Navarra, he basically was fighting a local nobleman by the name of Luis du Belmont and basically got outraged and chased a whole gaggle of knights. Well, the knights turned around and killed him and left his uh, remains stripped naked, stripped of all of its valuables with only a red tile covering his genitals because they said it was so mangled from the existence of syphilis so he probably one reason he chased after them he probably wasn't right in the head because syphilis does that to you um he was buried in a marble mausoleum in viana in northern spain and basically had an inscri uh, inscription 
and put on his tomb. Here lies in a little earth to whom everyone feared, to whom peace and war held his hand. Oh, you go in search of worthy things to praise. If you were would praise the worthiest, then your path stops here, and you do not need to go any farther. So, they gave him an inscription on his tomb equal to his swelled ego and the swell, you know, basically what he thought he was. He was also rumored to have had an affair with his sister Lucretia. I don't know <laughs> if that's true. It was certainly portrayed in the TV show. But uh, like his father, he liked women, he liked sex, and he liked power. And as a result, it led to his downfall. So that was Caesar. Borgia. Lucretia Borgia was basically a bargaining chip for her father. She was married to several high-ranking noblemen and royal royals around Spain and Italy, and was also widowed and divorced a couple of times, and was described as a femme fatale. She was just as devious as her brother Caesar and her and her father in getting her way. She would eventually have seven or eight children known uh all of them would eventually become either nobles or high-ranking members of the church just as pope alexander's other children would be married off uh or signed into church duty and would have children some legitimate some not that would become higher ups in royal families and uh the vatican and so the Borgia's influence lasted much longer than, you know, Renaissance Italy. Um, probably a good couple of hundred years you had Borgias in power with both the Vatican and royal houses. So uh, probably some of them are still around today. It's kind of like the Medicis and the banking industry and, and politics. You still have that influence. In fact, Caesar, Caesar Borgia was the you know, inspiration for Machiavelli's book, The Prince, the the one and only major textbook on manipulation. So that's how manipulative this family was. Um, a lot of the stuff in the TV show is, you know, dramatized for effect, but a lot of it is true. Now, we can look at this family as if they're evil, and I or we can look at them as being products of their time. Look at how these people were born. They were born into essentially Vatican royalty and other royalty, and they schemed and killed and manipulated to keep their family in prominence so they wouldn't be schemed against and killed. So were they evil or just doing what they had to do to move in their time? Because from what I've read about, you know, renaissance vatican it was all it was like any court of any king there was a lot of scheming involved and that's just what you had to do to survive so let me know what you think down below borgias evil or just products of their time or somewhere in between let me know what you think down below and i hope you enjoyed this very brief scraping of the surface of the Borgias, it, it can be very confusing with all the intermarriage and the manipulation, but let's just say they were the first family of the Vatican during the Renaissance. And with that being said, I will sign off for today, and until next time, Keto and Crime, out.